Hello, everyone, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me, as always, is my good friend, my loyal co-host, Mike Walker. How you doing, Walker? Always good, Mark. Well, this is a multiple of five episode, and as is the contract that we signed with the ineffable filthy gods of lucre, it is only every five episodes that we mention the fact that we have sullied ourselves by accepting money from our gracious overlords. But it's five already. I know, it's 65. Goodness gracious. But here, here's the thing. I don't want to be too cryptic. But we have some big news that we're probably going to be able to announce either next week or the week after. And I just want to say, in the context of the fact that we're going to – this is a very backhanded plug of our Patreon, the fact that we have one, patreon.com slash swag. We're only going to be able to take advantage of this great opportunity because of our Patreon backers. Something came our way, and again, we're going to get more details later that we would have had to say a hard pass to, personally anyway, uh, had it not been for the generosity of our Patreon backers. And by this, we don't mean to say that we don't appreciate the, the non-monetary support that our other backers give us and that our other supporters give us and anyone who, who bothers to spend any of their time with us. Just listening, yes. Absolutely. But we're really excited about what's going to be coming down the pike. And it was o- only by virtue of the generosity of some of, of 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 our patrons that we're going to be able to take advantage of it. So I'm super psyched about that. 100%. Exactly. So with that in mind, uh, let's talk about board games. That's what I thought we would talk about today, Walker. Did you have alternate plans? I did. I have this whole gutting a deer thing again that you said I could do this time. I said you could talk about it. I don't know why you keep bringing deer. This is a podcast. Do you understand the nature of the medium? I could go pretty detailed descriptions, and I could post pictures afterwards. Which also makes me wonder why in all these episodes you've had this mime every time. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, you know, it's the way Walker rolls. I realize you support the arts. See, now look how sad he is. Now he's, like, trapped in <laughs> he, here. He, he knows always looks, where the door is. He always looks sad, and he's always trapped. In, anyway, <laughs> so we're going to talk about board games this week. We're going to talk about the Aurus, our as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, which is Quartermaster General. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. Our feature game this week, which is Cthulhu War. And our topic, which is dueling rule sets, namely the right way to play. So, our Eurus, Quartermaster General Walker. Have you played Quartermaster General in the year since we reviewed it? Many times. And the several games of uh, several other games in the series as well. Correct. Because we also reviewed the Cold War uh, not too long ago. I will say this about uh, Quartermaster General. There's a second edition that is supposed to be coming out any day now, really, according to Griglin Games. I haven't seen it out in the wild. And I would very much like to see what they've done with it just to streamline how it handles all the expansions that have been released. Because since we reviewed it, there was the Quartermaster General Prelude expansion, which you have not yet tried. That's correct. And which I think, in terms of rules grit to benefit to the game, is one of the better expansions I've played over the past couple of years. It's really interesting. I'm excited for second edition because I want the Air Masters, or Air Marshal, sorry, Air Marshal expansion to come out again because I need to pick it up again. Because I gave my whole set to somebody. And I need to uh, replenish my collection. Now, why'd you go and do a full thing like that? Well, he claimed he was a friend, and then he disappeared. So there you go. Did he abscond to some to some far away to some far away land? Desertous land. Wow, I know that's harsh. He calls himself a doctor. That's the worst part. That sounds like a lie. I know, right? I sometimes get emails from people claiming to be doctors and relatives of dispossessed royalty in various far-flung countries, and it is very important to only send them half as much money as they ask for. That's why I'm really smart. That's your smart guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, we still play Quartermaster General. People uh, people have actually asked us to stop talking about Quartermaster General, so we should probably move on. But it's a six-player game. I did want to talk about that. It's very hard to find a good six-player game. Absolutely. Quartermaster General is a six-player game, so if you have a large group and you're having trouble finding games for six players, Quartermaster General is definitely one to check out. And it just keeps getting better. I mean, every, as I say, the Prelude expansion is really, really good, really tight. Anyhow, so let's move on. Moving on. Games that's played this week. I have a big blank there because I'll just be going on about more and more about family games. This was Easter for us, so lots of family gatherings, lots of small games, lots of cockroach poker, uh, Evil 7, oh, tons of Coyote. All of these are great games. All these are great intro games even for family members that don't normally play. I had uh, a really good weekend. Played a number that we've talked about a lot on the show, Voyages of Marco Polo, brought that out. Uh, PAX Renaissance again, which I've really been on a tear lately, and I'm I'm really starting to explore the system. Gloomhaven, I got to teach someone a copy of Gloomhaven that they hadn't played yet. 
was again reminded how clever it is. Kalamala won a bunch of friends. You know, it was the kind of thing where you lay out the board, it's all kind of drab. It's like, okay, there are these action spaces. And no one really felt it until a couple turns in the game. And everyone's like, wow, this is this is really interesting. And I, I'd be interested to see how it works with different action space selections. So in other words, uh, a, a number of the, the Euros that we've reviewed over the past year, I definitely got to the table and, and enjoyed that. But in addition, something we've been talking about slightly more recently, I got to play the drafting version of Res Arcana. Res Arcana being the lightning quick Thomas Lehman Tableau Builder from Sandcastle Games of this year, and it comes with a drafting version. Instead of getting random eight cards, you draft four cards, and then you draft four more cards. And what it did was it showed me more depth to the system because it, in drafting, it allowed me to make a prison of my own devising. No, 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 Claude, I'm not talking about you. Sorry, the mime got excited. He thought I was talking to him, but... Uh... And I was drafting these cards, and it's like, okay, I'm building this great combo. And what it displayed to me was that I did not know how to make a good combo in Res Arcana. <laughs> I was better off with the random noise in the system and then being like, I guess I'll do this. Because unlike the drafting system in, say, Race for the Galaxy, because drafting Race for the Galaxy is fascinating, in Race for the Galaxy, you just have these agonizing choices because you have to discard cards to pay for anything. But when you've drafted your entire deck, you want all of the cards. There's just no more easy uh, cards to get rid of. In Res Arcana, you, it, that, that pressure doesn't really exist because when you ditch a card to pay for something, which you're allowed to do, it's not necessary, you know you're going to get it back in short order, broadly speaking. And so I basically had this combo thing but no resource generation. And so it was just like, oh... I guess I'm a stupid idiot. And the deck just didn't work well. Anyhow, what this demonstrated to me was that there's a little bit more going on than I might have necessarily assumed. Because I didn't think that Res Arcana was the deepest thing in the world. But I do really like, I'll repeat what I said last week, I like finding an engine out of noise. I like trying to grapple with a bunch of cards that weren't necessarily designed to work together, but just give you enough grit that you can try to figure out how to get to point A to point B. And so I've been... I'll probably keep playing Res Arcana in the coming weeks because, again, of how quick and simple it is to get to the table. I know it's not Walker's jam, but uh, I've still been enjoying it, and that's Res Arcana. Got to play The Boldest. We talked about this uh, a few months ago in the news exclusively on the basis of its art. For about five hot seconds, The Boldest, which had just been only A, announced, and B, shown its box cover and nothing else, it got to the top of the board, gave you hotness. That's how good the cover art was. And whenever there's a game that, 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 that has that good cover art, I'm always concerned that the components aren't going to be as pretty. That's one of my first concerns, aside, above and beyond whether or not the game is going to be any good. I can tell you that the boldest, the interior of the game is as beautiful as the cover art. There are these endless series of cards, each depicting a person, and the drawings are amazing. It's basically this rust-filled, used future of cobbled-together weird artifacts and strange mechanical creatures, not entirely unlike Horizon Zero Dawn, the video game, or, or aesthetics of that, sort of, you know, the tribalistic, far future kind of thing, where all the machines are run down and, and everything is scavenged. And there are just endless pictures of very compelling-looking characters, now, they're all very simple card effects, but it's just it's just so visually compelling that, 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 I, that I feel like I have to stress that. You know, a sort of uh, multi-ethnic, diverse cast of far future badass people. It's just, it's just great. It's so visually arresting. I'm super excited now. Yeah. And the game... He, here's the thing, though. Uh, the game has been getting very mixed reviews from a lot of people. And that's because, despite the fact that it's a big box game and it's very much priced as a big box game, it's a very, very, very light relatively quick game. It's not quite a filler, and it's not quite a super filler like Kalamala is. You know, after you play a 45 to 60 minute game of Kalamala, you feel like you've done a Meteoro game thing. With the boldest, you play it for 45 for 60 minutes, and then you feel like you've played a very, very light game, which is fine. It's So it's sort of a blind bidding game with kind of a spatial puzzle lobbied on top of it. Basically, what you do is you set together adventuring parties that will trigger at various times, and sometimes you want them to trigger early, and then sometimes you get to look at the arrangement of where you're going to send these adventurers to go and figure, well, I want someone else to go first because they're going to get this crappy thing. And then I, if I go after them, I can get this much better thing behind it that they've uncovered for me. I was concerned that it was going to feel arbitrary and random and too chaotic, which is often what happens with me with blind bidding games. But to my surprise, I found like the level of control was just about right for a very, very light, somewhat chaotic, unpredictable game. You get to make some gambits and try to tease out various other uh, adventuring parties first. I enjoyed it. I thought it was good for what it was. I don't know if it's got a good niche. Again, 45 to 60 minute expensive full box non-fillers. It's, it, it's a little bit of an awkward sell. 
but it's so visually appealing that that you're going to find people who are interested in giving it a try. And I don't know if it's going to be for everybody. This is by so- Sophia Wagner, who did Noria. And Noria was also a bit of an odd beast, not a light filler-ish game, but it was had a number of interesting elements for a Euro management game. And so I was very much curious to see what she was going to do next. And it's a very different kind of game. And I'm going to play it at least another time, maybe another couple times, to see if there's any additional depth that gets revealed as as you play. And because I just want to spend time in that world, it's just a, such a fascinating place visually. And so I'll happily show you... I was going to say, I was worried for a moment because you were away. I thought maybe it was somebody else's copy. But we do... It is our... It is, oh, sweet. Okay. This is absolutely uh, a, a collectively owned uh, swag copy. So sweet. I will happily show you the boldest. It's fun. I just don't know how much staying power it has. And, and again, awkward, awkward positioning. I also got to play a classic called Snit's Revenge. This is by Tom Lamb, put up by TSR in 1977. Snit's Revenge is a super simple war game in which one player represents uh, the Snits and another player represents a single creature called the Bolotomus. And this is about the Snits invading the Bolotomus, trying to induce complete organ failure for reasons passing understanding. So basically, just to explain things, and this is more or less the entirety of the rules explanation, so everyone will is know how like to play. Is like a Dr. Seuss game? Uh, no, this is this is like what would happen if Dr. Seuss was told to make a con sim. Gotcha. And uh, illustrated by Tom Wham. Uh, so what happens is the Bolotomus has these compositors. Uh, they can either make snorgs after they've been kicked, or they can make makems. And if the makems get into the lapotum, they then become run and get And the run and get can chomp the snits unless the snits kick them first. Well, obviously. Yes. Uh, and the snits have to enter through the antifellum or the flut. Or they can try to dash into the Fleotis, but if you do that, you have to watch out for the Prolobosinator. Uh, so, you know, in other words... Yeah, that only makes sense. Yeah, it's straightforward. It, yeah. it, it works exactly how you would expect it to. Exactly. It's a game that writes itself, really. Like, I can't believe it hasn't been made already. It's well, it, like... look, it, look, in terms of a medically accurate, anatomically correct modeling of Bolotomus uh, anatomy, I think it's definitely the best con sim in its field. I, I challenge anyone to... to uh, to contradict that. Uh, Snit's Revenge had a couple of expansions, then it was republished by uh, Tom Jack, uh, Steve Jackson Games as just Snit's exclamation point. Oh, I'm sorry. Snit's! I, this was just the original. And uh, I gotta say, for uh, for a 20-minute rules explanation of Bolotomous Anatomy, followed by 15 minutes of a very arbitrary, hardly any choices to be made, but nonetheless very asymmetric, asymmetric experience, you know, I got what I wanted out of it. There you go. It was cute. Also, just as a quick note, uh, I would like to brag, I finally got a score of 25 in Hanabi. Played my first perfect game. I've been playing this game for years. Never got a perfect game. We didn't cheat, but we did get a little bit lucky in tile draws. You know, one player had all the tiles to play, and the other player, me, always had good tiles to discard, and so we never really felt a serious pressure for clues, and the tiles came out when you wanted, because the, you know, the dark secret of Hanabi is, is, even though it is a very, very good co-op game, with very interesting and straightforward uh, communication restrictions, it is the case that bad draws can make it impossible to get a score of 25, which is a perfect score. So I was very, very pleased. I finally got a perfect game of Hanabi without cheating. Played a game called Flick Fleet. Nice. We talked about this as well in the news. We did? Yes. Flick Fleet is a game of science fiction fleet battles where you flick the physical ships themselves and you flick to fire, but you don't flick to fire by trying to ram people. Rams are different things and they they don't really work. But the level of detail in Flick Fleet is really astonishing because you can have carriers that launch fighter wings. The fighter wings work on their own rules. You can fire nukes. You can fire defense le- uh, defense grade lasers instead. Uh, you can make bombing runs. It's 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 maddeningly beautiful as well because these are laser etched acrylic pieces that have details printed on them and the name of the ship on it. It's so cool. Yeah, I remember the Kickstarter looked amazing. I played on a friend's copy. It made me wish I'd, I'd pledged for it. Now the balance was very suspect extremely suspect. Just one play in, but, you know, and it, le- it could lead to some very easy uh, stalemate situations because the side with the giant, it's totally not a star, star Destroyer walker. It's completely and totally not a Star Destroyer. Gotcha. The extent to which it's just not a Star Destroyer is huge. I mean, yes, it's gray and it's shaped the same, it's, it's, but it's not, a, it's not a Star Destroyer. It has tremendous shield capacity and uh, very good fighter wings, but once the fighter wings are down, it doesn't really hit very hard. Uh, so, you know... The shields just keep coming back up. That was more or less our experience, broadly speaking. But it was, like, just to give you another example of the level of detail in Flick Fleet, there's a notion of where the thrusters are located. Where the thrusters on a ship is where you're allowed to flick the ship from. 
Wow, so it totally makes sense. It totally makes sense. Just lots of little details that really sell the universe and, and show you what you can do in a flicking game. And it is totally, totally our jam here at Silver and Wrong About Games. Flicking games and dexterity games that have little bits of detail and show you what you can do with that and little bits of strategy and uh, elements of miniature wargaming, all that stuff. We are total suckers for that. As long as it doesn't slow the gameplay down. As long as it doesn't slow the gameplay down, absolutely right. Uh, so, and this was a very, very quick game. Uh, as I say, it reduced to a stalemate at that point. We, we pretty much called it. But that could have been a fault of the scenarios. And look, lots of games don't have very solid s- scenario design. So I'm very much looking forward to trying more Flick Fleet. I'm going to try to get my own copy. Uh, apparently, there are going to be more copies in the wild sometime in August, maybe. So that was Flick Fleet. Finally got to play a, a new game called Magna Storm. This was by Baldrick and Friends, whose, pa- whose uh, previous efforts was a game called Power Struggle, which is a marvelously cynical game about corporate power shenanigans. It's, very, it's actually very good satire. Like, you never learn what this company does. And your employees get more corruptible the less enthusiastic they are about work. And every round, they just get less and less enthusiastic. Anyhow, so Baldrick and Friends uh, have now put up Magna Storm by Feuerland Spiel. It's weird. Uh, I've got a lot of feelings about it, more negative than positive. One thing I'll note, note, though, is that the theming is a total missed opportunity. It comes with these beautiful plastic pieces that are turtle labs. They're these sci-fi turtles. They kind of actually look a little bit like the turtles from Rising Sun in that they're these lovely little you know, pieces that you put out in the map, and they're these you know, sci-fi turtle things. Why they're turtles... It's never explained. There's just no reason for it to be turtles, which is kind of great in its own lunacy, but I really wish there had been some effort to just flesh out the world a little bit. You know, ride with the wackiness. You've got turtle labs for crying yeah, out loud. Yeah, a little blurb. Yeah. Yeah. Sell me on this universe. Come up with some nonsense as to why there are turtle labs. But no, nothing like that. It had a number of rules ambiguities, largely due to apparently a bad translation that was less less uh, unclear in German. But it was only a four round game. It nonetheless, felt rather plodding. Maybe that's why there's uh, there's there's Turtle Labs. I tried it primarily because Magna Storm offered, upon reading the rules, it looked like it was going to offer a solution to my track problem. I've commented before that I'm sick to death of tracks in Euro games. The last time a, game, a Euro game had tracks that I really, really liked was in point of fact Power Struggle, which also has tracks, but it's super competitive. You really have to care about where everyone is on the tracks. So you can't just go off and, and, and race up a track. It really matters. Magna Storm is kind of the same way. Where you are on these tracks is ultra relevant. And that part was good. I liked that part. But it's got this odd worker placement element, which is kind of bizarre and more cruft than it, than it needs to be. It's visually all over the place, literally, in that there are these three big boards. And most of the time, you're focused on one off to the side, but the other boards really need to be managed. It was a strange experience. No one at the table really enjoyed it very much. And to a certain extent, we're hard-pressed to say why. It's just that the pieces didn't come together very well, especially in a you know themeless, themeless game like that. I did like how competitive the tracks were, but for the rest of the time, it really felt like we were just spending a lot of time pushing cubes around to pay for resources and, you know, shuttling around and dropping these turtles. So it actually makes me want to play Power Struggle again because that that was a, you know, really fun, cute game that really sold the theme and, uh, you know, can make you fall in love with tracks all over again. I don't know if I'm going to try Magna Storm again, which is a shame because, again, I'm hard-pressed to really put my finger on why it doesn't work. It just, at the end of the day, failed to engage, possibly because of the theme, but I don't know. Lovely turtle minis, though. I love turtles. Yeah, you gotta love turtles. I love turtles. And that is what we played last week. And now, on to the news, and why it really doesn't matter. All right, so first of all, I'm going to talk about God of War. It's going to be a card game coming out by Simon Games, and it looks fairly interesting. Uh, God of War is a video game that's fairly popular out there, and so we'll see how this turns out. Hopefully the art will be nice, and it'll be a fast-moving game to sort of reflect the video game, we'll have to see. Similarly, in the Aegis of uh, Cool Money or Not news, they are going to be putting out Bloodborne the board game, another video game license. Bloodborne being basically uh, Dark Souls, but with a slightly different aesthetic. And the reason why I'm enthusiastic about this, actually, is because it's the next big project by Michael Chennault. And most people are more enthusiastic about Eric Lang's output, and I can respect that. But we actually really like what Michael Chennault does. We really like Xenoshift. We both like Rum and, Rum and Bones. And he does some interesting stuff sometimes. Now, I'm generally dubious about licensed stuff. In point of fact, the previous Bloodborne licensed product, the card game by Eric Lang, I thought was dull and kind of arbitrary and silly. So I'm enthusiastic to see what Chennault's been doing. He's been posting designer diaries online. 
in, on the uh, CMON website, so you can go check those out. He has some interesting ideas. Of course, it's difficult to know how they're going to merge together. But if you like the aesthetic of Bloodborne, the board game, uh, then they might be able to do something with this. And then maybe uh, CMON has moved on from endlessly making minis about Adrian Smith products, and now they're just going to be endlessly making minis about video game products. I don't know if that's necessarily an improvement or a sideways move or whatever, but uh, that Kickstarter is probably live as of the time you're listening to this episode, and if not, wait a few hours, and it will be. There you go. My next news is Ryan Laucat has announced two new games that might be coming out on Kickstarter. The first one is called Rome, and the second is called Sleeping Gods. Ryan Laucat is the same designer and artist that does Near and Far and Far and Away and Close but Not Quite There. <laughs> I believe you're referring to Above and Below. Above and Below. <laughs> He also did. <laughs> he also did Empires of the Void and Empires of the Void Two, the latter of which we talked about. Iron City, City of Iron, City of Iron. Close Sorry. enough. Great artist for me. That's pretty, that's pretty close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Great artist. I've loved all his art, and I've liked one of his games. It's true. Beautiful <laughs> art. Hopefully, these two will be just as gorgeous. We talked about having played Voyages of Marco Polo over the weekend. There is news of more Voyages of Marco Polo. Now, it is uncertain at this precise moment whether this is going to be a new expansion or a new standalone base game. But in either case, I'm very enthusiastic to see what they do with it. The plan is to have this out by Essen of this year, so this is a bit off in the distance, and it doesn't involve Kickstarter, so if it's not Kickstarter, it's hardly news, so I don't know why I'm talking about it. Exactly. How dare you. But there are already pictures in the wild of people playing with the prototype, and I'm just very enthusiastic to see what else they do with this. Though That group of Italian designers, I really enjoy most of their output, and I really love – we both really love Voyages of Marco Polo, so uh, more stuff is for the good. And Voyages of Marco Polo's expansions have been real good, broadly speaking. A couple modules we're not a huge fan of, but generally they, they, they've managed not to bloat it too much. So regardless of what happens here, I'm keen to see what, what, uh, what they put out. My last bit of news is just the fact that when GW usually puts out a game or something, that usually the support usually ends, unless it's one of their big games. And I'm glad to see that Shadespire, I'm going to call it Shadespire, regardless of what they <laughs> Well, it's it. Nightfall now. It's Warhammer Underworlds. Warhammer Underworlds is getting continued support. They even announced two more factions and more stuff. So I'm really happy that they're, you know, backing this game and keeping supporting it. And I'm hoping that I can get it to the table more because it is a fun game. And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. Most of my moves, news did not matter. On to the feature game. Feature game this week is Cthulhu Wars. By Sandy Peterson and Lincoln Peterson. This was put out by Peterson Games. I think that's a coincidence. Totally. Yeah. Because yeah. I've, I've got several games upstairs from Peterson Games. They're wonderful. <laughs> no, I think it's a coincidence that Sandy Peterson and Lincoln Peterson found jobs at Peterson Games. That, that was my suggestion. Uh, this was uh, put up on Kickstarter in 2013. You know, in 2013, I, I, I thought I had finally figured out that Kickstarter was off in a massive trap. I saw the pictures of these massive miniatures, giant hunks of plastic to- towering over the table, and I figured there's no earthly way this game could be any good. This is going to be a five-hour piece of crap. What I didn't know at the time, and we're going to talk more about whatever virtues or lack thereof that the game has, is that Sandy Peterson, he of Sandy Peterson, Lincoln Peterson of Peterson Games, Peterson Games being the Peterson Games Company that puts out, puts out the games of Sandy Peterson. This is the guy who in 1981 made Call of Cthulhu, which was, and in its new version, Trail of Cthulhu, was kind of the definitive Cthulhu role-playing game. And then later on in the late 80s, early 90s, he worked in the digital field, and he has hands in a lot of major projects. We're talking about the Civ games. We're talking about Doom. He was the, 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 the primary level editor for a lot of uh, Doom stuff. Uh, Quake, Age of Empires, you know, a lot of games that I didn't really like, but he was definitely a mover and shaker in the digital sphere. And in point of fact, just for for context, he put Cthulhu Wars up on Kickstarter with the expectation that maybe five idiots would buy it. And he just wanted to, to, to make a project with absolutely no holds barred. Just his ridiculous, beautiful vision of a unicorn that shouldn't exist and see what happens. And he was planning for it to be a one and done. And uh, things didn't quite turn out that way. No. Another crazy multiple edition, multiple expansion glut fest. So, Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary of what one does in Cthulhu Wars? A great one. Like, in Cthulhu Wars, you're always asking all sorts of questions like, how did you just do that? And (laughs) what lets you do that? And what am I going to do now? (laughs) Because it is very much like a cosmic, like an area control cosmic encounter. There are tons of abilities, tons of things that are going to change throughout the game. 
Uh, every faction has six spell books that are going to be, get flipped up, which gives them all sorts of new abilities. So things are constantly changing. And if it's a game that you don't play a lot, you're going to be sort of lost and not understanding why certain players are doing things or what you can do. So it's something you have to cost, constantly pay attention to and figure out. So like many games recently, and in fact, I think this 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 was sort of ahead of its time in a number of ways... It, this is a game of intense asymmetry. In Cthulhu Wars, the factions start out asymmetric, and as Walker says, they acquire six more special abilities over the course of the game. And so the combinatorics quickly, indeed, can start breaking your head. Fortunately, and this is, uh, this is something that we, we might or might not disagree with, I think that Cthulhu Wars manages to be playable, even for new players, and even for people who aren't necessarily accustomed to this degree of, of asymmetry for two reasons. Number one, it signposts very well, and I mean this in a sort of educational sense, because in order to get these special abilities, every faction has its own man, and it says, look, to unlock spellbooks, this is what you do. And there are six criteria, and, they diff- and those two differ for every faction. And I've talked about this, again, in the context of the Voyages of Marco Polo. I like it. When you have these tactical short-term goals, all else being equal, you might want to work towards these things. And it gives you a great deal of latitude because the order in which you accomplish them is more or less entirely up to you. Some factions are a little more streamlined than others. but And so it, it a lot of the details can get overwhelming. But in terms of what to do next, in terms of to try to advance your interests, you always have a kind of a clear goal. So that's the first thing. Is that, has that been your experience? Yeah, it's definitely. It's much like Ugong where – it's like you must go to the end of this track or you score no points. It's much like in Cthulhu Lords. If you do not have all six of your spell books flipped up, you cannot win the game. Because the majority of the way to win is once this track gets, you know, there's two tracks. If they get to the maximum point, then the game ends. And you can't win unless you've got all six of your spell books. So like you said, it gives you a definite clear path. And when you don't know what's going on or what to do, you can just go through your list and say, well, I'm just going to move towards that and get that done. I've also found, speaking personally, because although I've played Cthulhu Wars a fair number of times, I certainly don't think that I've achieved any level of mastery. And I think that it's still enjoyable when all you're trying to do is just struggling to internalize what your own faction can do. When playing a faction for the first time, I personally don't get the sense of being overwhelmed. Well, I played them all now, but I don't get the sense of being overwhelmed with what they can do. I find it's relatively easy to just apply all the things that they're able to do, especially since I've unlocked them piecemeal. So it kind of, again, more signposting. And once you get that down and then you start playing more and more, you can then move on to the next level about caring what, how the other faction special abilities will trigger. So yes, absolutely it's the case that in your early games of Cthulhu Wars, it's going to be, wait, how did that ability work? I didn't know it could do that. But, you know, conscientious reminders from other players could, uh, are excellent. Like when someone moves into your territory, say, look, if you, if you start a fight with me, the following nonsense is going to happen. And you really can just decide what level of combinatorics you want to internalize. If you are willing to engage in those kinds of heuristics, which I respect that not everyone is. This is what makes Cthulhu Wars very easy to teach because there's very minimal front loaded stuff, right? Because everything is in each player's, you know, tableau, right? All the big rule stuff. So it's very simple. It's very much like Blood Rage or many of Eric Lang's games where you're going to uh, amass a certain amount of power and then you're going to use that power to do your actions. And then once you're out of power... Or you want to pass, you go down to zero, and then, you know, you're passing, everyone else uses up their power, and you're done. So while other people are taking their turns, you can sort of internalize what you need to do and look over what they need to do, so you can sort of learn the game as you go. And they come with these great reference cards, which, you know, simply says, this is how you get your power, which is the first thing you do. This is how you score your victory points, which is next, and this is the few actions you do. You're going to spend out, you're going to spend some power to move your guys. You're going to spend power to fight. You're going to spend power to summon some guys. That's pretty well the base rules. You know the game. Go, and off you're, you're off to the races. Easy to teach, easy to play. Uh, like you said, hard to master because of so many different special abilities. I think it's very appropriate that you compare it to the output of Eric Lang. I think actually the, the more appropriate comparison is to Chaos in the Old World which came out four years or so before it went up on Kickstarter. The similar, some of the similarities, actually, between Cthulhu Wars and Chaos in the Old World are so close as to make me borderline uncomfortable. Like the, To me, Cthulhu Wars really does feel like Chaos in the Old World 2.0. Really? It's funny, because I was going to finish this segment with the comparisons to Scythe. Six spell books to win, six stars to win. You have your workers out collecting resources. Once they get you know beat back, you have to put them out into play. You're putting these big gods out on the board, like your mechs, 
which give you more abilities. Just like in in Scythe, you're putting the monsters out that give you more special abilities. You're blowing my mind, Walker. Combat is implied. Much like in Scythe, you know, you have these big mechs. You think there's going to be these big fights. And same, this is another point I was going to make, where fighting is sort of implied in Cthulhu Wars. There is fighting. They have lots of dice. But it really doesn't happen that much. And it really doesn't affect the game too, too much. Mm, Okay, there I think you've lost me. Because, first of all... In my experience, there are vastly more fights in Cthulhu Wars, and they start earlier than the fights in Scythe. It's true. It's definitely more prominent in Cthulhu Wars fighting. But, I mean, it is it is not as much as you think it would be. Well, okay, that really depends, I think, on how comfortable people are with the game. But, secondly, uh, one element that Cthulhu Wars has that really sort of amps up this notion of direct conflict and makes it feel very different from Scythe. Although, I gotta say, those structural similarities, you really are, it, it's like I'm seeing the Matrix for the first time. That's very impressive. <laughs> In Cthulhu Wars, you can start eating your opponent's cultists. Now, there's, it's actually one of the, the, the most complicated things for people to understand. There's a notion of hierarchy and you can go and eat something with something better unless they're guarded by something. Anyway, it, it, it's not very complicated, but in the game as simple as Cthulhu Wars, rules-wise, it's probably the most complicated thing. And it's very lucrative to do, and it's very painful for the opponent, and it, it helps inform a lot of the movement. And it helps inform a lot of what you have your monsters and great old ones do. And it's so vicious and satisfying to engage in this jockeying to actually pull it off. It's one of the areas of direct conflict and direct friction between the players that I really think helps make uh, Cthulhu Wars more interactive than a lot of other even comparable, you know, elaborated dudes on a map games are. And in a way, it makes it feel less uh, less like a dudes on a map game because, again, it's an element of direct conflict that isn't combat, although it's very combative in a number of ways. Yeah, and it's, it's something you can react to. It's not as though a player can do a bunch of things and there's nothing you can do. It's much like Barony or these other things or Tigers and Euphrates where you imply, you apply some pressure in one area and you force them to reinforce there or else you're going to eat one of their cultists. So you're sort of like making them focus somewhere. You're sort of trying to control the play. So another thing that I really want to stress about Cthulhu Wars, and this is probably my favorite aspect of the game, although it comes with a huge caveat that will uh, reveal the end. And, And if you think you know what the caveat is, you're probably right. There is tremendous flexibility in Cthulhu Wars. All told, as of now, there are nine different factions. And most games of this ilk, whether it's Blood Rage, whether it's Chaos in the Old World, whether it's Root, and I'm not saying that all these games are the same, but they have some structural similarities. Uh, Root is perhaps uh, the the best example of this. When you're playing Root, you can't just have everyone pick whatever faction they want to do and go. That doesn't work. In fact, even some of the suggested setups are borderline uh, a little bit wonky, uh, if not outright degenerate when you ignore their suggestions. Cthulhu Wars despite the fact that all these factions are so different, and despite the fact that they have all these different powers and will acquire all these different powers, I have never found a combination of factions amongst the nine in any player count from three to five that felt seriously wonky, with the exception of something I'll talk about in a second. But just in terms of the sheer faction combinations, they've all felt tight and satisfying and engaging, and I never felt that one faction completely obsoleted another or completely steamrolled anyone else. And I have no idea how any human game designer could have possibly done that. Nor do any of them seem similar in any way either. Like, they're all very unique. Even, I'll put, bring up another point, even the miniatures. Every single faction has a totally unique set of figures. None of them are the same. And... Even even the number of like there's like he said there was a hierarchy there's you know great old ones there's monsters then there's your cultists and even the the cult everyone has the same number of cultists but the other numbers are always you know mixed up and different it's a very interesting way they've balanced it that way and on top of this this isn't this really is an entire game line unto itself. So there's the base game, which comes with four very different, very satisfying factions. There's five more five more factions you can buy. There's a whole bunch of different maps. There's a whole bunch of independent great old ones that you can get besides, and a whole bunch of other stuff. I will say this, speaking personally, although I really like the additional factions, all the rest of the stuff I have found eminently ignorable. And in fact, some of the maps in particular and the great old, uh, the independent great old ones have been borderline degenerate and in many ways completely spoil the beautiful flexibility that I find in the core game. Let me just give you one example of how some of this really upends things. You know, some of the maps are okay. Like the, the great library at Celiano is one that I kind of like. You're running around, there's this, there's this monstrous librarian that comes and gets you if you make too much noise. It's kind of cute. 
you take out books and the books make you stronger. A quick note on maps before we go too much deeper in this. Sure. They're much like Kemet maps, right? Where where they've made it so you're very close to wherever you are. You never feel trapped or blocked in. So I just want to, you know, throw that in there quickly while we're talking about maps. Well, that's an excellent segue because one of the maps that I played, which is called Dreamlands, is really like someone who who didn't understand or didn't appreciate how well the other factions had been set up, designed it. Because in, in the Dreamlands map, there are these various spots on the map that are very, very dangerous to hold. At the start of every round, there's a random chance that basically units on those dangerous areas are going to get nuked. One of the factions has their start area on one of those places. And that is crazy bonkers bananas. Because if in the first or second round, just when you're starting to get going, because there is a ramp up in Cthulhu Wars, it doesn't take very long. This is a very quick and and to the point game. But if in your first or second round, your home base is destroyed by a random act of this map, that's absurd and, and nonsensical. And I sometimes, when dealing with all this extra cruft, whether it's investigators, independent great old ones, new terrorists, stuff like that, it makes me appreciate how well the factions were designed because I don't get that sense from them. But a lot of this other stuff, I do get the sense of. All right. Another good point I want to make you've already alluded to is playtime. It's very quick, very easy. You get a lot done in less, probably about an hour. I'd say if if you have people that know what they're doing, because the setup's very quick as well. You know, everyone gets their little faction card, like I already said, just like, you know, Scythe, it tells you where you're going to start. Put your six cultists out and off you go. Every perception I had of the core game was completely wrong back in 2013 when I thought I knew everything. Now I know everything. Then I didn't. I thought I did, but now I do. It's not overlong. It's really, really, really tight. The rule set is also tight and compressed and simple to teach. And things are reasonably well balanced against each other. This is not like, you know, first generation FFG nonsense where where ridiculous components come with, you know, no thought to the rules. This has come together in a really, really compelling package, completely contrary to, I mean, because it looks dumb. I don't mean it looks dumb in the sense you look at it and said, oh, the components look bad. No, but it looks so epic and grandiose and that it's going to be this, like, you know, six-hour, you know, slugfest of monsters beating themselves against each other. Yes, it looks like a dumb game. It looks like it's something that we slap together as a cheap, you know, cthulhu theme ripoff kind of thing. Well, cheap in the figurative sense, not in the literal sense. And it really isn't any of those things. It's not what I would call subtle, but it's awfully clever. And it completely blew me away the first time I played it. And it's one of those instances of really, you know, learning not to judge a book by its cover. And I really do enjoy seeing all the different factions work against each other. Now, the theme, just 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 for a note while we're talking, uh, since I mentioned the theme, the theme is like a it's like a wild B-movie kaiju version of Cthulhu Wars. It's like, who could beat up who? Hastur or Nyarlathotep? It's like, yeah, okay, that doesn't make any sense in the context of, of the Lovecraftian mythos. But that's okay. In fact, I, I kind of prefer that because the dominant versions we tend to have are typically things like, well, Joe Diamond buys a shotgun to shoot Yig in the face. And it's like, that doesn't... Mm, doesn't True. do it for me. I have that under a bad point. I don't feel that there's any theme in the game whatsoever. I don't feel like I'm oh, really? I feel I don't feel like I'm subjugating humankind. I don't feel like, you know, I'm doing anything. There's not like a mech- mechanism in the game that says, you know, now, you know, sacrifice, you know, this many humans or you know, you had you played you played the one faction where you are actually corrupting parts of the land. You know, maybe they have it, but it, that doesn't happen very often. You're right. The, the the theming we've talked a lot about thematic integration. I will I will grant you that you don't really get the sort of narrative evocation that the really really good thematic invocations get. This is sort of like uh, fanfic of the various monsters in the Cthulhu mythos, and, and not much deeper than that. Sure, I, I'm I, sure. I, like it's in the rule book, and if you're into it, I'm sure you can create it while you're playing. But in the mechanisms or in the gameplay, it's not there. Yeah, I mean, some of the mechanisms are vaguely evocative of what the monsters like, sure, but you're right. It's not, it's it's relatively skin deep, but the skin is so visually and, and, and thematically compelling, I think that that's okay. And, exactly. And, and at least it doesn't have the vestiges of the tremendous racism in Lovecraft's writings. True. So that, and, that's and what, I'm not saying it takes anything away from the game either. I'm just saying that sure. it's, it's not this, you know, huge Cthulhu feeling game, that's all. I don't know what a Cthulhu feeling game looks like, other than say the, the role playing games like Call of Cthulhu or Trail of Cthulhu, because you know when you when you look at the uh, you know the pre Ramsey uh, Lovecraftian stuff again when you when you separate all the racist nonsense, it it really is about 
ineffable madness and unknowable cosmic horrors, and you can't really do that very well in a board game. Like, now, Moments of Mansions of Madness did it. Sure, second I, also think, I also feel, I think the others did a good job of that as well. It really felt when you're fighting in this, you know, dystopian future and everyone's getting corrupted and you're in the last city and these things are, you know, swarming in, I did feel as though, you know, you were the last hope of... Of humankind. That's a good point. To, to, to my mind, as someone who's enjoyed some of, but not many of, of Lovecraft's writings, you know, what's key is the sense of futility, of hopelessness against an unknowable evil. And to a certain extent, that d- degree of ineffability, that degree of unknowableness, of incomprehension is incompatible with board gaming fundamentally because everything needs to be transparent. Uh, now, again, the promise of app-driven games, like when Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition, really starts to sing. You get some of that, uh, but not a whole heck of a lot. And th- that's kind of why I prefer, actually, the the absurdity of Cthulhu Wars theme. That it really is just a slugfest between all the giant great old ones that just show up and start punching each other in the face. Well, maybe that's maybe that's part of it. Like, it, it, humankind doesn't matter anymore. Now it's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, this is what's happening. Exactly. And everything else is just, you know, fodder anyway. Exactly. But I take, your, I take your point. That is a very good insight. So, first, I think we always have a problem with first player and turn order. I think they did a great job here. You randomly do a first player, and then whoever has the most power or generates the most power at the beginning of the turn gets to be first player. And if they're already first player, then they can either take it or give it to the person they tied with. But the interesting part is the fact that they can either make the turn order go clockwise or counterclockwise, and that sort of, like, mix up, mixes up the game, and I think that is... And it, and it works fine, and it, it never seems to be a problem in the game. All right, that's all my good points. I got some bad points. Take it away, Walker. All right. I have, I've written down too many powers, but that's not really the case. There is enough powers, but there is just a lot of them. And like we already alluded to that, like we already alluded to first time players or like you said, there's nine different factions. It'll take a while to even learn them all. So you're constantly trying to figure out what your opponents are doing and what you can do because you really need to know what your opponents do so you can monkey wrench them a little bit, right? Because in order to slow them down, sure, you can just, you know, out and out fight them. But if you know how their faction works, there's some easy things you can do to sort of like slow them down without taking your entire turn up. And there are some commonalities across factions. Like combat, although it's the case that lots of powers apply on top of it, but most people are vulnerable to being killed. And eating cultists is always a great way to, to, to ruin your opponent's plans. But I will say... I've never done this personally. I've played with gamers like this, but I've never played Cthulhu Wars with them. There's some people that refuse to take a move or refuse to proceed on to what they're doing in their turn unless they fully internalize the entirety of the game state. What everyone is able to do at any given time or what anyone could do in the future. Cthulhu Wars, playing Cthulhu Wars with them is probably going to drive them mad. And maybe that would be the thematic evocation that we're looking for. Be- and I've, I've seen reports of this, of people on the internet, people who are very, very good at games and can play lots of games, but refuse to play Cthulhu Wars because there's just too much going on. There's a lot, un- unless you've internalized everything about all the factions, and I don't even know that that's possible, let alone desirable you're going to have to accept a certain degree of noise. You're going to have to accept that you're going to be surprised because you forgot that Crawling Chaos can force you to retreat somewhere else or someone's going to activate a power and you forgot that they had it. If you're not okay with that, then I sincerely encourage you to not play Cthulhu Wars, certainly not with the delicious variety of additional factions involved. The price. Price point is awfully high in this game. Oh, yeah. Never mind with any of the expansions or or the... The things, and that leads into the fact that there's multiple versions, so you're not sure when you show up at a place they have Cthulhu Wars, what versions they have, or what versions they're used to playing. So the price and the number of versions. So we both, I think it's fair to say, to sum up our positive points, that we both really enjoy playing Cthulhu Wars. 100%. I'm going to say, all told, I probably shouldn't have purchased it, and I probably shouldn't have acquired all the expansions that I have. Because we are talking about a lot of money. And we normally don't spend a whole lot of time talking about money. We reviewed a $200 game last week and we barely mentioned that it was that it was 200 bucks on Kickstarter. The base game of Cthulhu Wars is $200 for four factions. And each faction past that is another 50 bucks. American. You know, real dollars. And on top of that, I might have <clears throat> acquired some other things besides. And that's a crazy quantity of money for a single game. Now, you know where the money went. And again, I, I, I'm sympathetic to the notion that you're not paying for components, you're paying for development, blah, 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 blah. And we're obviously very impressed with the development work that went in here. But you're also paying for the giant figure of Cthulhu that towers over everything, every other board game component you've ever acquired. You're also paying for the massive Tsothogua and his beautifully sculpted grotesque nipples. And the 15 extra pounds you have to carry around now with this, you know, glut of plastic. No kidding. But above and beyond the fact that this is tremendously costly... 
And you have to compare that to what else you could get for that degree of money. And we've made comparisons of Cthulhu Wars to lots of other games that we love. You adore Scythe, probably more than I do. I like Scythe. Scythe is good. We both adore Root. It was our game of the year last year. And it's also not a very similar game, but it's also a very asymmetric, lots of different ways to approach things, kind of dudes on a map sort of thing. Chaos in the Old World. You could probably get an out-of-print copy of Chaos in the Old World for half the price of a set of Cthulhu Wars. Less variety, but, you know, half the money. You could definitely get... Uh, Kemet, which will also allow you to buy lots of special powers and do weird things over the course of a fighty game. Blood Rage, we could go on and on and on. Yes. And I don't, I, I cannot counsel that any human being with an ounce of sense could get Cthulhu Wars if they don't have, uh, if, if they don't already have a lot of those games. And if you already have a lot of those games, I still don't know if I could counsel you could do what I did and get all this stuff. And then, on top of that, there's the fact that this $200 for the base game still gets you cardboard gates. You're going to have all these beautiful figures for the factions, these giant great old ones, and the gates, which are one of the primary foci, foci of the game, are just these cardboard tokens. I had to pay an extra however many dollars to get the beautiful plastic gates to go on top of that. And then I had to buy upgrades for the car, to, to make the cardstock tracks thick cardboard because that's something that you would expect in any game, let alone a $200 game. So I'm not going to say that these component missteps are inexcusable, but in the context of so much money, it's a bit strange. All right, gate segue. Gate segue. Because uh, my word here, I have snowbally. What you do is you go into a particular part of the map with a cultist and you take a build gate action. And you put this, like Mark said, either your cardboard cutout or this really cool gate miniature on the board. And now you're generating more power. And now since you're generating more power, you can build more gates and get more units. And so, you you know, if, if you don't get checked quickly, you sort of snowballed into winning, not winning the game. You snowballed yourself into being very powerful, and I think that is a problem in the game. Well, like most games of this ilk where you're expected to engage in conflict and you're expected to predate on people, the game relies on a certain amount of self-balancing. In Cthulhu Wars, if you ignore... If you've got two gates and you ignore the person with four, then yes, the person with four gates is absolutely going to snowball. So... There, that's a little bit of fragility in the design, but one I think that that is often, though not always, easy to overcome merely by virtue of the fact that since gates are so overwhelmingly important for everybody, it's usually pretty darn obvious if somebody's running away with a gate advantage. But I will grant you, if you have a couple of really bad early rounds, it can be very hard to catch up. And the last thing is I've already alluded to is the combat. So Mark thinks it's powerful. I'm still going to suppress that's not. <laughs> All of these figures all have a combat value. Your cultists normally have zero unless you have ability or some sort of faction that gives them power, but they all either have three, a value of three or six or ten or some special ability that gives them a, a ridiculous amount. And this is how many... Usually more like one or two, actually. Yeah, and this is how many dice you're going to roll. And the dice are either going to come up blank or make your opponent run away or cause a kill. I think there's, what, one in six chance of causing a kill and two in six chance of making them run away. So a lot of the times you're just starting a fight and everyone just vacates the area or you know what i mean it just it, it's to me it just doesn't and you're spending power in order to do this and you're spending one of your actions and more than likely all you're doing is making your guys run away that you just spent all this power to move them in there in the first place and i have combat is the jade game in chaos in the old world <laughs> and no sorry sorry jade sorry combat is the jade jade game in cthulhu wars to a certain extent, I agree with you. Combat can be very fluky. Most of the time, though, you enter combat in Cthulhu Wars by virtue of some other power that you want to trigger or some power you want to deny uh, your opponent or because you went and tried to eat a cultist and you can't do that. And I will, I will say this in defense of the combat of Cthulhu Wars, and this is, this is a very mild defense. Your complaint previously about how someone could run away with too many gates, because everyone's figure count is fixed, the more gates you control and the more gates you occupy, the, the thinner your spread. And it is impossible to defend that many gates against aggressive incursions by their players. They're going to eat your cultists and or they're going to fight and kick you out. And so I agree with you that combat is fluky, especially in terms of the way the dice work. And sometimes it's a very low volume dice roll. And that makes the results even more fluky. And that can be unsatisfying. But in the context of people aggressively checking people with more power, with more power and more gates, I think it comes out acceptable. At the end of the day, for me, it really does come down to the cost. Having made these ill-advised financial decisions, I really enjoy Cthulhu Wars. 
and especially given the extra factions that are involved in the variety. And even whether or not I enjoyed it, I would still marvel at the fact that you can get nine so asymmetric factions, each with six radically different powers and radically different spellbook conditions, and that they all work in combination with each other and in pretty much any combination. That is masterful. All the rest of the stuff... As I say, you know, investigators, uh, expansion maps that you play to six to eight players, uh, colored gates, unique cultists, terrors, all that other stuff. I, I, no, no, just not interested. Uh, the ones that I've tried, just not okay. Sometimes a different map, sometimes. But I don't know that I can recommend this product to any human being unless you're fabulously wealthy. It's such a strange product. At least Sandy Peterson knew it was a bizarre thing when he put it out. He thought that nobody would. Uh, he thought that practically nobody would want to buy this thing. It's a minor miracle that it's been as successful as it is, both in terms of a game design as a product line. And looking at my collection now, I don't know why I spent all this money, but it's still a really great game, and I love playing it. So I'm glad I have it, but I don't know if I'd do it again. Agreed. My sum up was the whole scythe. You know, comparison, but what I'm going to say, because I didn't really talk about it very much, was the power system. And it's very much like uh, like Chaos in the Old World or Blood Rage, where you can sort of do a whole bunch of small actions and let everyone else use up their power and then therefore, you know, control the board more. And I really enjoy those types of games where you have to watch what other people are doing, see how much power they have left, figure out what is the most important thing that you have to do now, not showing your hand too early in the round and then finishing them off. That's where... So if you like, you know, either of those games, then see if you can find someone that has a copy of Cthulhu Wars and try it first and... Befriend some fool like me who failed his sanity check and went all in on this absurd creation because it's great, but so is the cost. Agreed. And that is Cthulhu Wars. And who puts out Cthulhu Wars? Uh, that would be uh, Peterson and Peterson who work for Peterson and distribute Peterson. Awesome. All right. Now on to the topic of the week, which is dueling rule. <laughs> Walker has been taken over by the slime god Sathagua. We are going to give him a moment to emerge from the formless spawn that he has been sending into and regain his human conscience. He has grown tendrils and oh my God. All right. Topic is dueling rule sets and the right way to play. When a published game has a number of different versions that you can play it as, and there really are, it's not even a question of the the proper rule set versus the errated rule set. It's that there are several rule sets. Well, that's what I have in here. Yeah, designers. All of all of them equally quote unquote notes valid. Or, yeah. yeah, precisely, precisely. So, I mean, the broad the broad thing for me is I generally don't like it when a game has a bunch of fundamentally different ways to play. Tons and tons of optional modules. Again, kind of like, in, in the case of Cthulhu Wars, it's mostly because I don't like them. But in the context of some of the other games, it's I feel like there is some sort of opportunity cost I'm paying by picking one way as opposed to another. I, it, actually, the sensation, this is a strange analogy, but it, it's actually true for me. It feels a little bit like playing a game when an expansion has just been announced for it. I feel like I'm paying an opportunity cost. I, I, why play it like this when I could play it this other way? At least in the case of an expansion, you can just wait for the expansion and then play it with that. I'm not saying it's rational. I'm just saying that that's, that's the analogy I have. So let me, let me actually start with one thing because if, if, I don't, if I don't get this out, I might forget it, even though it's so important. Loop and Louie. People often don't understand or question the sincerity of my enthusiasm for Loop and Louie. Loop and Louie is legitimately one of my top ten games of all time, but there's only one right way to play Loop and Louie, and that is with the tournament rules, as designed by uh, friends of mine, Robert Cedar and Nathan Dilday of Boston, Massachusetts. These are available online. I will give. I will include a link to the full tournament rules in the episode description. I mean, you can play the way children play. That's fine, uh, but also children can play the tournament rules. The the the, the proper way to play Loop and Louie. The the finger pinky in the air way. Don't make fun of me. This is important. Loop and Louie matters. It's true. Is with the tournament rules. Uh, so I just want to flag that right away that uh, sometimes it is there is one clear, obvious right way to play, and that is the tournament rules for Loop and Louie. When you said tournament rules, I will go back to my GW days. And we used to play miniature games however we wanted. We used to say, okay, no magic this, that, and then the tournament scene started and that's pretty well ended, you know, about 15 to 30 players just stopped playing (laughs) 40k and Warhammer because it became so 
intent with some people that they had to win. They had to do the 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 winning army list or or whichever had to have the best army list. And we we just played for fun. It's like what would happen if this unit did this or that unit did that. And so I think sometimes the tournament rules ruin things. And I think sometimes it's the best way to play is the funnest way to play. I remember, especially gaming before the internet, how there would just be dueling interpretations of given rule sets. And I don't mean like minor interactions. I mean fundamental disagreements about fundamental aspects of the game. And there was no opportunity for errata or anything to clarify things unless you wrote to the publisher and they would write you back. I remember some really intense arguments about how Battletech worked uh, back in the day before we could we could check on Board Game Geek. And sometimes you would just have regional variations. Like, I remember reading some stories about people who used to play Warhammer Hardcore or any other tabletop miniature rule set, and you would just go to another store or another city. It's like, oh, that's how you do things. Okay, that's interesting. And that's one of the homogenizing effects of the internet that I think is really good. It's put to bed some of these dueling rule sets that exist by virtue of uncertainty and ambiguity. There are some exceptions, though. Uh, Have you ever played a choir? Yes. So Acquire is an interesting uh, instance because there it's just a question of a rule book being silent as to something. In Acquire, there are great doctrinal conflicts about whether you should play with money and shares open or money and shares closed. And people are very, very, very firmly of the opinion that their way is the correct way. I've tried it both ways, and in both ways, Acquire doesn't really do it for me. But uh, it is it is fascinating how in the original rules for Acquire, it was just silent as to whether that works. And it turned, it makes the game very different in both ways. I'll go back to some GW stuff. I'll just go with my notes. You know, go for we, it. we always do this. We always, you know, put out a topic and we'll just interpret our own ways. With GW is when they came out with multiple editions, right? This is, you know, the sixth season, the tenth version. I'm not sure what version of Warhammer they're on now, but, you know, they've completely scrapped the old one. But then there was always that group of people that just wanted to play the old set or said, no, this new set's terrible. We want to play with the old set. And my... You know, my always interpretation was, well, be why? You know, what are you going to do? Go to another city? Now they're not playing that way. It's like, you need to, you know, just, you know, keep up with the most current rule set because that's what you need to play with type thing. You know what I mean? You have to keep with the times. You have to, this is what they're going to support. So this is what you have to play. I'm always fascinated by by games that manage to maintain multiple parallel systems based on that kind of planned obsolescence. I'm talking specifically about Magic the Gathering. I don't know the details because I haven't played Magic since high school. So, you know, you, you can play Legacy or you can play with whatever. And, and all of these are still supported by Wizards of the, Co- uh, the, Wizards of the Coast. It's like, look, we're going we're gonna to dial back to a previous edition of the rules deliberately so you can keep playing this other way, which is an interesting approach. And w- certainly one way to deal with this which version do you want to play issue. So let's just go back to way, the way they do it. We're talking about when in the rule book they say here's different ways you can play the game. They really need to say, this is how the game is played. And after you're tired of this, then here's some different things you can add in and try later. I, I agree. Oh, I, I definitely I, have to say, this is the game because otherwise you're going to have, you know, people causing issues. This is how the designer wants you to play the game, yep. the core game. And then when you're tired with that, or you want a little bit of variation, try these other things, but they're separate. Yes. A little bit of editorial vision. I couldn't agree with you more. So let me ask you a pointed question then. We're both big fans of Imperial. Yes. And Imperial 2030. Correct. Imperial is probably my favorite game that still has this level of ambiguity. Investor card or no investor card? Gotcha. Always investor card. Always (laughs) investor Because that's another, like Acquire, this is an area of great doctrinal disagreement amongst Imperial players. I enjoy it both ways. It's a different game in both contexts. But the mere fact that there's this ambiguity makes me uncomfortable for reasons that I'm hard ple- hard pressed to explain. Again, it's kind of that opportunity cost. This notion that I'm you know splintering off into my own little corner of, of the imperial universe. I just wish there was just a, yeah. I wish that there was a sort of default recommended way, and the other were presented as a variant. But that's just not how it works. And I'm willing to forgive Imperial because it's such a great game. But and then. You know, right after we say, you know, follow the rules and, you know, they have to say a certain way to play. We just talked last week about how we changed catacombs. Yes. Right. So stuff like that, where you just want to streamline it, make it more accessible to people or more within the time range that that type of game really should take. Sure. I've got another couple uh, really interesting historical examples here that I want to talk about. One of them is Dune, because Dune's back in the news because Gale Force 9 is going to be uh, reprinting it. Uh, Dune is, uh, in many ways, the poster child of a game that's been played now for uh, 40 years, 
It was released in the 70s. And there's no consensus about how to play the thing. This is not about fundamental rules questions. People have smoothed that out. But when it comes to Dune, you have optional rules, you have advanced rules, and you have tournament rules. And in the optional and advanced rules, they don't come as a package. You can pick and choose which ones you want to apply. Talk to two Dune players, talk to two Dune groups, and you're going to get two radically different versions of the game. And that is... Strange. It's just this weird little uh, little uh, fact that not everyone is playing the same game, which which is great. I mean, that that's fine that there, there's so much room. But I remember when I first wanted to try Dune for the first time, it's just this sea of possibilities. And you show up and ask, how should I play this game? And you're going to get 12 different answers. It's baffling. My example would be Shadow Rift, because every time we play Shadow Rift, we have to scour the Internet because they've added expansions where they don't you know, have any rules on how to incorporate these expansions into the main game. And so, you you know, you, you search it and you get old erratas or conflicting erratas. And it's just so infuriating that the designer and or the publisher haven't, hasn't just put out this definitive answer on how to do this and, and be done with it. Well, they, they put out a document and I managed to print it. But then when we tried to find it again, we had difficulty. We're going to have to we're going to have to chase that down. Maybe you can just scan it and photocopy it because there is now a latest version about how to do it. But the problem is some of the easier ones to find, especially if you just Google for these answers, you will find Jeremy Anderson, the, develop, the, the designer of Shadow Rift, showing up and giving you earlier versions of how to do it. And so you see this evolution over time, but you can't it, – it, it's hard to find the latest one. A similar thing happened with my other with, – with the, the other example of rules ambiguity that I find fascinating. That's for sale. Such a simple game, but in different editions, they've had different rules about how to do bids. In one version, after you pass, you take back half your bid, round it down, and in the other version, you take your half your bid, round it up, which – is a relatively significant difference in how your money flows. What makes things even more confusing and maddening is that every time the designer has commented on the issue, he's made things more complicated, not less. And so there's this... Whenever you play for sale with anyone who's who's been around board gaming for a while, you always have to have the discussion, wait, how are we doing bids now? There you don't tend to find doctrinal conflicts. People are usually willing to play either way. But it's so fascinating that these issues can persist for so long, even with the homogenizing effects of the internet. And yeah, Shadow Rift is another great example. And the other, my last point is about, I'm just wondering, because there was a game that came out a while ago, um, and there's a few times that this has happened, because it's happening with video games. A video game will be pushed out, and it'll be fixed after the fact. And I'm wondering if this is happening more and more in the board game field, where we'll push this game out, and we'll say, oh, we'll just let the players fix any problems that they find. And there's a game called Century Saga, that we, that we, it was a Kickstarter that came out. And I don't want to go too much into it because I didn't do a lot of reading into it. But the emails that I was sent and the little bit that I did read, it, it was almost like, oh, what problems do you find? Just just send us how you would change the, the <laughs> scenarios and, you know, and we'll fix it. Or how would you do this rule? Or how would you – it wasn't to me personally. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't. They weren't reaching to me, Mike Walker, to fix these problems. It was just like to all the backers. Although perhaps they should. No, they really shouldn't. To all the backers – you know, how should we fix this problem? You know, trying to fix the game after the fact. It was just like, oi, really? Yeah, it's weird. We, we've been mentioning Root, and it's... I agree with you that all this ex post facto changing stuff is is generally a, a troubling sign in many instances. That having been said, I really do like it when the volume of data that you have to which you have access by virtue of the internet informs minor tweaks, particularly to improve game balance. Like, I approve of the changes in Root, especially when the publisher makes every effort, and later games has been very, very good at making it cheaply available for everybody to update their copies. That's something that they've, they've been doing. On the other hand, I do remember back to, you know, Avalon Hill, which is to which, to my mind, was the previous golden age of gaming. And you would have massive games put up by Avalon Hill that had, you know, where the sum and total of the errata was on page three, there's a misplaced comma. That's it. And that's all they had. And it's a good thing, too, because otherwise it would have, you know, you never would have known about the mistake unless you happen to subscribe to the general and you happen to get the one issue where they talked about it. True. I always love the the Games Workshop ones where they would print, like, perfect-sized things inside the Games work in the White White Dwarf, dwarf, and you'd cut them out and you'd paste it over top the rule book and your rule book would be up to date. I always miss that. That was fantastic. That having been said, I, I, I do wonder... Whether this is just a, a nostalgia golden age fallacy business where I'm I'm re re remembering Avalon Hill titles being less problematic. Like I just I remember that uh, well for just as just another example, Avalon Hill's Republic of Rome was reprinted by Valley Games, you know, in the area of the internet and crowdsourcing and all this other all, all this other stuff. And they took a game without 
misprints, and they produced a game with tons and tons of misprints. Now, that's not to say that Avalon Hill never produced games with misprints. There were some problems in Upfront and, and, and uh, you know, an, an infamous misprint there. But, I mean, by and large, I really, really do get the sense, although I'd be interested in seeing data, that there does seem to be a higher preponderance of misprinted games coming sure. forward. Well, speaking of Golden Age, I've always loved Avalon's Hill system of, remember, it was like 1.21. Oh, right? yeah. And and all the numbers were categorized. So if you wanted, you know, combat, you knew it was in two and it was all subcategorized so they could always refer back to the number. Do you know what company still publishes rule books like that? Not Walker? GMT. I don't want to hear it. It's garbage. Garbage games for garbage people. So that's what we think about dueling sets in the right way. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email of hypocrisy, just roll the dice at gmail.com. That's J U S T R O L D A D I C E at gmail.com. That play GMT games.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we will get back to you if we can. Thanks again very much for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.